before i begin i request everyone to kindly mute themselves and still see if you have them uh, unmuted thank you very much warm greetings and good evening from the chennai center for china studies it is a pleasure to welcome you all to today's webinar title behind the bamboo curtain china surveillance camps and genocide a panel discussion on china's excesses in tibet east turkestan and southern mongolia the official data of communist china indicates and identifies 56 ethnic groups the persecution of religious minorities isn't a new phenomenon as beijing is insecure about religion as it can mobilize the masses and thus threaten its totalitarian form of governance be it buddhists christians or muslims all have been systematically subjugated by the communist party of china for instance tibet has been illegally occupied and ruled by china since 1951 in a calculated and systematic strategy aimed at the destruction of their national and cultural identities what's most repulsive is china's so called reeducation camps which is nothing but a move to not only eradicate the beliefs beliefs of the uyghur community but also change the political demographic balance of the region just like in tibet people of the han community are being pumped into this region to remember this this also eventually led to the infamous 2009 urumqi riots in which many uyghurs were killed surprisingly even the organization of islamic cooperation as well as pakistan and turkey who claim to be champions of islam have maintained an uncanny silence and the reason for this is simple both prioritize friendly relations with china above safeguarding islamic beliefs and basic human rights of uyghur muslims mongolia's language is part of what makes a person mongolian and if a person loses their language they lose their national identity these were the words in a protest banner opposing the chinese government's decision in september 2020 to curtail bilingual education in inner mongolia the southern part of mongolia was annexed by china to become the inner mongolia autonomous region since then the chinese communist party has gradually eroded the cultural and the culture and independence of the region's ethnic mongolian population beijing has also encouraged han chinese to relocate to inner mongolia where they now outnumber mongolians by nearly 6 to 6 is to 1 what is common in today's panel discussion consisting of distinguished panelists representing tibet east turkestan and southern mongolia these are all recognized as one of the most unstable regions constantly featuring among the top targets of human rights and cultural erosional violations committed by the communist china the series of webinars with experts by the chennai center for china studies will examine how china has evolved as it celebrates its 100 years of the establishment of the chinese communist party where it has grown in terms of its ability to repress people ethnic cleansing economic exploitation human rights violations cultural genocide including persecution and its repressive assimilation policies to present this topic we have three distinguished panelists here with us today connecting across time zones first we would like to welcome mr tenzin lekshe since 2000 he has worked in central tibetan administration by taking various responsibilities notably at the department of information and international relations dharamshala india tibet coordination office in delhi bureau of his holiness the dalai lama delhi and tibet policy institute dharamshala On July 1, 2021, he was appointed as the official spokesperson of the Central Tibetan Administration and joined the Department of Information and International Relations. Currently, he is he is also additionally taking charge as the director of Tibet Policy Institute. Our next distinguished panelist, who is not new to C3S and needs no introduction, he has already addressed us once in 2020. His Excellency Sali Hudaya, Prime Minister of Government in Exile of East Turkestan. He joined the East Turkestan government in exile at the special parliamentary session in Washington DC in April 2019 and was also subsequently appointed as the ambassador to the United States and assistant to the prime minister. A third distinguished panelist is Mr. Ingebatu Togocho. In 2001 he and his colleagues created the Southern Mongolian Human Rights Information Center SHRIC. Currently he is the director of the southern mongolian human rights information center he has previously represented before the united nations forum on minority issues 
United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and United States Congressional Commissions on China on Human Rights Conditions of Southern Mongolia. We are privileged to have you all here with us today. Thank you once again for taking your valuable time out to be with us. With these words, I would like to hand over the floor to my director, C3S, and Regional Director, National Maritime Foundation, Tamil Nadu, Commodore R.S. Vasan, for his opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Bala. I think Bala has already set the ball rolling and has provided the context under which we are all trying to hold this panel discussion. As correctly brought out, all these three rep representatives who are here, you know, are going to tell us about what they are facing today. Not that the world does not know. In fact, just yesterday, all of us would have seen this news that AP News was for the first time allowed in this area to look at the so-called concentration camps, etc. And they all have done a good job. I went through the entire report like some of you also would have done. And obviously, China would like to show them only what they want the rest of the world to see. It's very clear. So you call them concentration camps, they would like to call it education camps. You call it something else, they will call it something else. And also, uh, you know, the issues which are there are uh, not new to us because uh, Mr. Sali had, uh, uh, you know, addressed uh, our members uh, last year. And, uh, you know, we had a, a very interesting session at that time, where he brought out to clearly to say that East Turkestan was never part of China. The story is no, no different in the case of Tibet. You know, the Tibet again, you know, you can go through history and say, you know, the Chinese will always tell you that everybody was under us. We are the Middle Kingdom and we are ordained from the heavens above and therefore we rule over everyone. What we claim is ours today, what we have not claimed is ours tomorrow and whatever is in doubt is also ours. So this is the context in which we are going to have these discussions and that is how, uh, you know, we, we obviously would like to bring about greater awareness on these very sensitive issues related to Tibet, related to East Turkestan and also Southern Mongolia. What is also again clear as far as Tibet is concerned, you know, we have a very close relations with the Tibet Policy Institute and the Chennai Center for China Studies has an MOU with them and the members were very, very honored and lucky to visit the, the Tibet Policy Institute in Dharamshala and His Holiness gave us one hour audience for the members of C3S. At that time it was, you know, an eye opener to listen to him. You know, he clearly said, that there were so many of these documents that were destroyed, you know, by the Chinese when they raided Tibet, and particularly some of the monasteries. And, uh, you know, he told me that we are the custodians of some of these holy books, which we carried with us when we came here as refugees. So that's the kind of bonding that exists with us. I think uh, there are no doubts today in majority of the Indians to say that we committed a monumental blunder by allowing China to overtake Tibet and establish their rule there. The, the, the more days pass, the more it's clear that, you know, perhaps India uh, committed this biggest blunder of the century to allow Chinese to come into Tibet. It was Tibet and it is Tibet that's our neighbor and not China. By allowing the accession, we allowed China to become, have a border and a border clash with us. So this is the situation, whether it is Tibet or Xinjiang or Southern Mongolia, our guest speakers will discuss this issue because there is greater control and today they are using artificial intelligence, they are using science and technology, they are using everything that is there to keep surveillance on the people and activities out there. And the so-called re-education camps are something that, that is extremely uh, important for, for us to learn about. So I will not take more time, I will of course be uh, summing up towards the end. So I'd like to give more time to my friends. This is the first time that, of course, our friend from uh, Southern Mongolia has come here, where again, the story is no different. But uh, I would rather have, uh, you know, listen to them firsthand and uh, enable this panel discussion through the process. And as has been requested, I would request all the audience to kindly mute themselves. And also, please put their uh, questions in the chat box. It becomes easier for, for us to manage the questions uh, in an organized manner and uh, you know, not allow the floor to be uh, taken over by one person or another. With this, I'm again very happy uh, to welcome all the three distinguished uh, delegates today and uh, I request them to conduct this session. Over to you, uh, Nisha. 
Thank you, sir. May I now request Mr. Tenzin Lekshir, Director of the Tibet Policy Institute and Spokesperson of the Central Tibetan Administration to deliver a special address. Over to you, sir. So could you please unmute yourself? Uh, thank you so much for this privilege to join you all on this session, uh, the panel session, which is behind the bamboo curtain. Right? In fact, uh, we can also say that it's an iron curtain also. Right? It's a, a really strict regime where uh, not much of information are coming out, not from whether it's from Tibet, or Xinjiang, or East Turkestan, or Southern Mongolia, right? Even from Hong Kong also. Even from, so therefore, uh, this very discussion is, uh, I think, timely. And uh, we we'll need to understand where these uh, lost nations are and uh, what the struggles of these people are. And then how uh, the Chinese are also trying to interpret their own right, uh, missions to occupy th these countries. So therefore, I'll, uh, I'm happy to join Mr. Sali and then uh, Togo Chok by, by representing Tibet over here. So as you might have heard that yesterday, uh, Chinese president was on a visit to Tibet, but uh, it was in the limelight, but people are all talking about what he's doing inside Tibet right now. Somehow, you'll understand that this is, even though it's a very secretive visit, but, but we expect that every 10 years, the Chinese leaders move to or visit to Tibet. If you look back from 2001, uh, Hu Chindao, when he was a vice president, he visited Tibet in 2001, when they celebrated the so-called 50th anniversary of the peaceful, so-called peaceful liberation, right? In 2011, Xi Jinping himself, when he was the vice president, visited Tibet right, to celebrate the 60th anniversary. So this year is the 70th anniversary of the so-called peaceful liberation of Tibet. And also this year marks the 100 years of existence of the CCP. There were lots of jub jubilance. There were lots of poems, but but somehow we need to understand that the past 100 years of the existence of the Chinese Communist Party is not right to celebrate because it was built on the bloodshed of millions of people. If you look back by right, in the world history, but the, the, the world, even though we look at Hitler, or some other people who are notorious, the world notorious leaders, but the number one killer of the world is Mao Zedong. Right. During his reign, more than around 65 million people died. So this Chinese Communist Party was built on the bloodshed, which are not to be celebrated. Somehow, Xi Jinping, the, the incumbent president, he said that China need to rejuvenate. They need to live up to the Chinese dream. They tried to introduce the, the nationalities like Tibet, occupied nationalities like Tibet, right, East Turkestan, Southern Mongolia, to join hands in celebrating this year. But somehow, Right. This is not the time for celebration for all of us. If you look at 70 years of Chinese occupation inside Tibet, the so-called peaceful liberation, the name itself says it's a peaceful to liberate. Now the question is, why, from whom China liberated Tibet? And China still do not know whom they liberated from. Right. Sometimes they said that they liberated Tibet from the federalistic rule. Sometimes they said that they, Tibet was liberated from the imperialist rule. So, but still, the question is from whom China liberated Tibet? Therefore, 
there was a strategic reason, there was a political reason, because at that time, at that moment, when the Communist Party became a regime, right, they tried to expand. When the world tried to shrink, when the colon colonism was down after the Second World War, China became the number one colonizer in the world by occupying Tibet, East Turkestan, and Southern Mongolia. But therefore, the, there isn't any kind of celebrations. Even though Chinese president came to Tibet to celebrate the 70th year anniversary, but from the Tibetan side, we still say that this is the, the struggle. The struggle is still moving on. 70 years has passed, but as China says that the blood is thicker than the water, the Tibetan always says that our cause is still there. And for the Chinese president, when he visits Tibet, I'm sure he will look at the aspirations of the Tibetan people and see what the Tibetan people really want, not just the buildings and the concretes, right? So therefore, it is a high time for, because I take this opportunity because right now the Chinese president visited Tibet. So he need to look into the real core issue and resolve the Tibet issue, right? And through the middle way approach, we should seek a dialogue and resume the dialogue for resolving the sino tibetan conflict. So by going to, towards this topic, I would say that if you look at the topic, the Chinese surveillance camps and genocides, since the Chinese occupied, as I said before, it was in a peaceful liberation. Right from 1950 onwards, they crushed the Tibetan. It was a bloody right massacre, but there was a genocide. We still say that the Tibetan, more than a million Tibetan died because of the direct consequences of the Chinese occupation, right? Not just people died, but there was a destruction of Tibetan culture, right? Tibetan ecology was also being, right, exploited, right? The economic marginalization was very much there. The language, if you look at the language, if you look at every aspect of the Tibetan traditions, but right. there wasn't anything. And we, right now, we look at the cultural genocide. Right. The people were dead. Now, when you look at China, right, over the last 60 years, whatever measures they take, they take mainly through the hardline policies inside Tibet. Right. The hardline in suppressing the voice of the Tibetan people. So therefore, but I still believe that China need to have a more wisdom to understand where Tibetans are, what Tibetans should need, what Tibetan needs, and how the China should approach in the conducive manner so that both the Chinese and the Tibetan are in the win-win solution, right? So if you look back to the surveillance, if you look back to the camps, right? Since 1949, when they came into Tibet, they built roads, right? The hard level started right there. During the, when China was under the Great Leap Move Forward, when China was under the Cultural Revolution, Tibet also experienced the same struggle, right? The Tibet went, the Tibetans went, millions of Tibetans went through the hard labors. They used to call Gogo, right? Hard labor forces, right? So what they did, initially, they constructed roadways by using the hard labels of the Tibetan. The roads were being introduced to subjugate, to colonize the Tibetan country. Right? Therefore, right from the beginning, China has been doing this. And it was not new to Tibet. We have experienced that, but uh, the secret labor camps, but we have also, right, uh, have the gulags, the forced labor camps, thousands. If you look at Power Tramo, few, uh, just a month back, there was a book, 
right, by a Tibetan, young Tibetan lady, right, who struggled under these, right, hard labor camps in Kongpo area, right. So therefore, uh, I think these gulags, these labor camps are not new to Tibet, right, and they still do because they want to suppress the Tibetan voice. Uh, what happened is, in this new era of socialism in China, I don't know, I don't believe that there is a socialism as such, but, but still, they impress upon a Chinese characteristics. Now inside Tibet, but China says that the Tibetan Buddhism is of Chinese characteristics. In the name of socialism, China has looted Tibet, vandalized Tibet, destroyed Tibet, right? And they still do that, right? And therefore, uh, what we felt is that uh, there is a, a serious threat of civilization inside Tibet, right? There is a uh, the real pace of drastic demographic shift going on inside Tibet. And that's a real threat for Tibet. I now request His Excellency Salim Badia, Prime Minister, East Turkestan government in exile to deliver a special address. Over to you, sir. <clears throat> uh, firstly, I would like to thank the Chennai Center for China Studies and its director, uh, Commodore R.S. Vasan for hosting this much needed event on China's ongoing uh, campaign of genocide, colonization, and occupation in East Turkestan, uh, Tibet, and Southern Mongolia. Uh, I would like to address some very crucial issues regarding the uh, history of Chinese occupation and colonization in East Turkestan, uh, China's ongoing campaign of genocide of the Uyghurs and other Turkic peoples, along with the nature of the Sino-East Turkestan conflict and the response or the lack of response by the international community. Well, I will start off by addressing uh, the history of East Turkestan. Uh, according to Uyghur historians such as Purvan Almas, East Turkestan has been the homeland of Uyghurs and other Turkic peoples for over 6,000 years. Except for brief periods of illegal Chinese occupation, East Turkestan has a long history of independence with a distinct ethnic, political, cultural, and religious makeup. In 1877, the Manchu Qing Dynasty invaded East Turkestan and occupied it in 1884, where they renamed it to Xinjiang, meaning originally the colony, now often known as the New Territory. Uh, during this time, they began to settle Chinese colonists into East Turkestan in an attempt to dilute the demographics and to keep East Turkestan under Chinese control. However, as a result of this, uh, the national movements that were happening in, uh, in India at the time, many of the uh, our leaders of our early national movement, they had they were studying in India, so they came back to East Turkestan and led the national movement in East Turkestan, leading to the first East Turkestan Republic being declared in 1933. The first East Turkestan Republic was short-lived due to Soviet intervention and Chinese uh, nationalist invasion. Uh, however, after the first East Turkestan Republic, the nationalist China or the Republic of China, they began to engage in similar uh, atrocities, uh, very much similar to today. In fact, in 1937, nationalist China, with the uh, Chinese warlord Xing Sei, purged over 200,000 Uyghur and other Turkic leaders, intellectuals, students, clerics, businessmen, and other influential people. This, with the same objective what Chen Changuo is doing today, led to 
great discontent, discontent in East Turkestan. And in 1930, 43, the people of East Turkestan once more uh, rebelled, leading to the establishment of the Second East Turkestan Republic in November 12, 1944. East Turkestan was able to maintain its independence as an independent state until December 22, 1949, when the People's Republic of China, the, the then newly established People's Republic of China, invaded East Turkestan and formally overthrew the East Turkestan Republic. However, this was as a result of Soviet help um, and intervention that the the Chinese communists were able to take over East Turkestan. On August 27th of 1949, our top 11 leaders of the East Turkestan Republic were called to a meeting in Moscow. Um, however, their plane, the official explanation was that their plane crashed and that they all died. Uh, we see this as a political assassination Shortly afterwards, 30 senior other military and government officials of the East Turkestan Republic were also assassinated by Soviet agents in East Turkestan. And in December, the Chinese communists took over East Turkestan. And the first thing that they promised us at that time was, oh, we are going to help you develop and modernize East Turkestan, and we will, you know, withdraw our forces in three to five years. That never happened. China calls its occupation of East Turkestan a peaceful liberation, a so-called peaceful liberation. However, from China's own records, from Chinese state media at the time, Urumqi Radio, some 150,000 so-called ethnic splitters, counter-revolutionary separatists, and ethnic nationalists were killed by the Chinese People's Liberation Army in the first five years. In addition to this, hundreds of thousands of our people were enslaved and used to create exactly the infrastructure projects, the roads, the railways that were needed to bring in and flood East Turkestan with more Chinese colonists and their occupation forces. It's the similar situation in Tibet. Over the Next decades, China began to eradicate any essence of our political identity. The existence of East Turkestan itself became banned. Even using the name, the term East Turkestan in itself was a crime punishable by imprisonment, if not execution. However, the people of East Turkestan have never stopped resisting Chinese occupation. Throughout the 1960s, we had the East Turkestan Revolutionary People's Party who engaged in conflict, um, in guerrilla conflict with the People's Liberation Army in hopes of liberating East Turkestan from Chinese occupation. Uh, during the same period, the Chinese began to test their nuclear weapons in East Turkestan, starting in 1964, which lasted until 1996. And according to Western researchers, some 750,000, and this is a minimum conservative estimate, Uyghurs and other Turkic peoples were killed as a result of the nuclear testing. In 1990, with the fall of the Soviet Union, the people of East Turkestan once again regained hope to strive for their independence, seeing the Central Asian republics regaining their independence, we too strive for our hope, and this led to a, re a renewed national movement in East Turkestan. That started with the 1990 Baran uprising in April 5th of 1990, uh, which was unfortunately a failed armed uprising, but nonetheless, it gave us inspiration to resist and continue uh, struggling for our people's independence. This is the period in 1996 that China began its so-called strike hard campaigns. Uh, starting in 1996, China began to launch a series of so-called strike hard campaigns, which it 
called uh, specifically targeting what it described as separatism and illegal religious activities. This was followed by another campaign officially named as the Rectification of Social Order Campaign in 1997. It too was followed by a people's war against separatism and religious extremists in 1998. And in 1999, the Chinese government carried out what it called a special 100 day strike hard fight. In 2000, they also renewed another strike hard campaign targeting what it called separatism and extremism. After 9-11, China began to portray the East Turkestan uh, people, East Turkestani people and those striving for independence as terrorists, capitalizing off of the global war on terror and the ongoing, um, and the fact that the Uyghurs and other Turkic peoples in East Turkestan were majority Muslim. This led to the Chinese government in 2003 enacting laws that banned the, speak, the teaching of our language in schools under the so-called bilingual program, which is essentially monolingual. It also restricted religious and cultural practices. This for, and then they furthered their, um, their uh, campaign of colonization by settling in millions of Chinese colonists into East Turkestan, while at the same time taking young Uyghur and other Turkic women and men into China to use slave labor in Chinese factories. This resulted in a massive brawl at a Chinese factory in Shaguang in June 26th of 2009, in which several thousand Chinese factory workers in a toy factory in Guangdong pr province attacked roughly 600 Uyghur uh, workers, killing dozens of them. This led to the people of East Turkestan in Urumqi to take to the streets and demanding basic, you know, equality as, you know, promised under Chinese law, demanding an investigation into the brutal killings of the Uyghurs in uh, the toy factory. And this, in fact, was what led to the permanent ban of YouTube in China. In July 5th, 2009, tens of thousands of Uyghurs peacefully took to the streets of Uruchi to protest the killings of Uyghurs and Shaguan and to demand equality and to be treated as, you know, first class citizens and not as second class citizens or enemies. The Chinese government responded as it routinely responds with a heavy crackdown and shooting and killing indiscriminately at protesters. This in turn into rioting as a result of Chinese instigators. And then the Chinese government arrested tens of thousands of Uyghurs uh, from the streets and there are videos showing them going door to door, arresting all males that they can find. Um, and in 2009, they clamped down, shut down the entire region, turning off the internet, phones, wireless communications, uh, banning journalists from even coming into the region. Then in 2010, they started implementing another strike hard campaign against so called separatism and religious. But then this expanded in 2014 to what they officially called it the special campaign, um, the strike hard campaign against violent terrorism. This was the newest version of China's routine so called strike hard campaigns in East occupied East Turkestan. And this was the start of China's so called vocational training and re education of the Uyghurs. It wasn't until 2017 that the international community began to pay attention to the issue. And in 2018, the United States government and the uh, UN, some of the UN bodies began to raise the issue. In 
2000, in May of 2020, the U.S. Department of Defense estimated that some 3 million or more Uyghurs, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, and other Turkic peoples were held in concentration camps. The Chinese government itself stated in a white paper from September 2020 that 1.29 million Uyghur and other Turkic peoples were sent to vocational training and re-education camps every year from 2014 to 2019. The white paper ultimately hinted that up to 8 million Uyghurs and other Turkic peoples have gone through training and re-education in, in the period of six years. To clarify, vocational training and re-education are the sick euphemisms used by the Chinese government to describe what are actually concentration camps, similar if not worse than the Nazi concentration camps that everyone is familiar with. As of 2021, the international community has described China's atrocities in these concentration camps and throughout East Turkestan as genocide. Uh, this was fall initially started with the United States government in January of 2021 and lead, followed by parliaments of Canada, the United Kingdom, Lithuania, uh, Belgium, and um, the Czech Republic. Essentially, in the concentration camps, people are being forced into these concentration camps regardless of their religious affiliation, uh, regardless of their age, but mostly based on their ethno-national identity. The fact that they are Uyghur, Kazakh, Kyrgyz, or other Turkic populations that are East Turkestanis. And the whole post, the whole issue of this, the whole reason behind this, is as part of China's Belt and Road Initiative, is to prevent East Turkestan's independence. China fears that East Turkestan will regain its independence, and this would ultimately uh, be a roadblock and be the end of its Belt and Road Initiative and its uh, imperialistic agenda. Um, in fact, the Chinese government in 2019, they have made it clear in their national defense strategy that preventing the independence of East Turkestan is one of their top national defense goals. In the concentration camps, people are being subject to forced sterilization, forced indoctrination, rape, sexual abuse, uh, torture, and over 36 million people's DNA samples, voice prints, and retina scans have been collected in East Turkestan alone, where the Chinese government is, we don't really know exactly what they are using it for, but we suspect that it might be to monitor our people and to you know match organs with potential um, buyers, because the Uyghurs are being killed in large numbers for their organs and their organs are being sold as halal organs to Muslim countries, to Muslim, you know, wealthy Muslims from across the world, which is in itself a very atrocious thing. In recent years, despite numerous condemnation by the international community uh, and sanctions by the United States government, Canada, uh, and the European Union, uh, the UK and, Emma, and others, the Chinese government has been relentless in its efforts to eradicate, if not assimilate, the, the people of East Turkestan. And as of 2021, as of July 2021, there are concentration camps and prisons that are not only still there, but they are being expanded. They are growing in size and growing in numbers daily. Um, and the Chinese government, as um, Mr. Uh, Bala mentioned earlier, the Chinese government is, you know, has allowed uh, AP to visit one of these concentration camps, which it formerly calls a vocational training center. Previously. But now it has rebranded it as 
a pretrial detention center in an attempt to legalize uh, this extrajudicial internment of millions of Uyghurs. In addition to this, you have over half a million, at least half a million, according to the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, uh, Uyghurs who have been forcibly transferred out of East Turkestan into Chinese provinces where they are being used as slave labor uh, to produce products for various, uh, you know, Chinese companies that work with Western companies, um, products from, from like Apple uh, for, you know, iPhones, uh, products like Nike shoes, the small electronic components and other things from clothes to textiles to electronics, all these are being made with the slave labor of Uyghurs. So the international community's actions have not been able to persuade, uh, have not been enough to persuade or to pressure China to stop. In fact, more recently, Xi Jinping stated that their policies in East Turkestan are the right thing to do and that they will continue. In fact, just two days, three days ago in East Turkestan, right ahead of the Eid uh, celebrations, the Chinese Communist Party and the so-called Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region government uh, held a meeting in which they highlighted, which Chen Chengguo, the butcher of Tibet and East Turkestan, highlighted the need to continue uh, pursuing the path of Chinese national rejuvenation in East Turkestan. Uh, and what does this mean? What does Chinese national rejuvenation mean? What does this mean for East Turkestan? And what does it mean for Tibet? What does it mean for Southern Mongolia? This means nothing less than the full eradication of East Turkestani, Mongolian, Tibetan identity, their culture, their language, and their very existence in the generations to come. In East Turkestan, not only are our people being, you know, subject to, our pe people that are alive being subject to torture and internment in camps, but even those that have deceased, even those in our graveyards are being destroyed. They are being bulldozed with malls and other sites being built over them. And this is part of China's efforts to eradicate the existence of our people of East Turkestan. And their goal is to eradicate our existence in you know, years to come. Hopefully that will not happen. And so we are urging the international community to take more meaningful actions. The international community for a long time has failed to address the East Turkestan issue on a real, uh, as, a, as, a real uh, as a real issue. Um, the nature of the East Turkestan conflict or the Sino-East Turkestan conflict has been underlined and pushed as just a human rights violation. This is the farthest from the truth. The nature of the East Turkestan Sino-East Turkestan conflict is the fact that China illegally occupied East Turkestan on December 22nd, 1949, and it has been colonizing East Turkestan against the free will of the East Turkestani people, resulting in this simultaneous ongoing genocide. While many nations have, in the international community have condemned the ongoing genocide and atrocities, they have failed to adequately address the issue by ignoring the roots of the conflict or wrongly framing it in terms of mere human rights violations instead of addressing it as what it is, an international conflict. Governments across the world are self-censoring in an effort to appease Beijing's so-called self-proclaimed sensitivities uh, in the hope that it will serve their own interests. Uyghurs and other Turkic peoples in East Turkestan are now routinely referred to as ethnic minorities 
when in reality they are an occupied people. And East Turkestan is being is routinely being referred to as Xinjiang or a region in Western China, when in reality it is not a new territory and it is not and it has never been a part of China. The world has gone silent on the true nature of the East Turkestan conflict. The PRC does not have any sovereignty over East Turkestan, and East Turkestan is an occupied country. And also, legally speaking, the Sino-East Turkestan conflict is an international conflict. And the people of East Turkestan have the full right to independence as defined under the UN Charter, as right to self-determination, and on the 1967 uh, declaration granting independence to colonized nations and peoples. Therefore, governments should not treat East Turkestan as an internal uh, affairs of China because it is not an internal affairs, China's internal affairs. It is an occupied country. The international community has a responsibility and obligations vis-a-vis -vis East Turkestan and China. And we assert that acting in accordance with these obligations is not only about doing right by the East Turkestanis, the Uyghurs, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, and other Turkic peoples, but it is by upholding international rule of law. And it is also a political and security imperative as well for all of the international community, especially those countries that neighbor us, like India, Tibet, Central Asia, who too are being encroached by China day by day. So in this regard, I'd like to follow up to end uh, with calling on some, you know, giving some policy recommendations uh, for governments and international institutions and uh, think tanks uh, such as the uh, Chennai Center for China Studies. One, it's imperative to call this the Sino-East Turkestan conflict and East Turkestan as what they are. In other words, to use uh, the correct language and to press your governments to use the correct language that reflects the truth and the international legal status of East Turkestan and the East Turkestani people, and not the language desired by Beijing that uh, purposely, uh, you know, perpetrates and solidifies this false representation of East Turkestan and its people. It should be made clear that East Turkestan is an occupied country. In the case of India, it should be made clear that India borders occupied East Turkestan and occupied Tibet, not China. The Sino-East Turkestan conflict is an international conflict. It is not a Interna internal affairs of China, nor is it merely simple human rights violations. The Uyghurs, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, and other Turkic peoples of East Turkestan are an occupied people. They are not a minority. And the Chinese colonists in East Turkestan are colonists. The Chinese settlers there are colonists. They have no right to East Turkestan, just like other, you know, former colonial powers had no right to India in the case of the British and other places. Uyghurs and other Turkic peoples are not Chinese Muslims. They are Turkic peoples and not all Uyghurs are Muslims. This is another thing that needs to be addressed. We ask everyone to use the term East Turkestan when referring to our country and not the Chinese term Xinjiang because using the colonial term Xinjiang which means the new territory to refer to East Turkestan only helps to advance Chinese imperialistic ambitions and the ongoing genocide in East Turkestan. Secondly, we urge the international community, and this is governments, institutions, uh, such as, again, the Ch Chennai Center for China Studies, to not raise the human rights issues in East Turkestan without addressing the underlying conflict in its political, security, and international dimensions. 
Western governments uh, have raised uh, concerns about human rights and any human rights violations in East Turkestan. And while we are grateful uh, because this is necessary, but it is not enough. Without addressing the underlying uh, conflict in, you know, in East Turkestan, the, the international conflict, it signals an, accept an acceptation or an acceptance of China's representation of East Turkestan as a so-called China's internal affairs and outside the international purview to where the international community cannot get involved or uh, to help stop these atrocities. Three, we urge everyone to be mindful to not give China what is not theirs. In the case of foreign governments, um, we urge them not to give China what is not theirs as concessions. Um, independence is the right of East Turkestani and its people. It is not a concession that can be made or given by foreign governments or institutions. For any country to make such concessions, they not only undermine the democratic rights and principles of East Turkestan and its people, but it also violates established international laws. Lastly, we call on for gl stronger global action. Governments across the world need to take meaningful action, such as recognizing, formally recognizing East Turkestan as an occupied country, raising this issue at the United Nations and other international institutions, calling out China for its violations of other territory of their nation's territorial sovereignty. Um, and on the case of the present ongoing genocide in East Turkestan, we urge governments to grant refuge to Uyghurs and other Turkic peoples who are fleeing the genocide. We urge them to help uh, in uplifting and empowering our community, our diaspora, and our government in ex exile so that we may uh, more effectively strive to regain our independence with the help of the international community in a democratic and peaceful uh, fashion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, next would be a special address by Mr. Inge Bartu Tokochok, after which we'll be again moving into Mr. Tenzin Lekshe. Over to you, sir. Hi, good morning, uh, good evening. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the China Center, Center for China Studies uh, for organizing this panel and inviting me to talk about the issues and the challenges the Southern Mongolians have faced under the Chinese uh, colonial regime in the past uh, 72 years. But before I touch upon the touch upon the various human rights abuses and political repression in Southern Mongolia, uh, let me begin by giving you a brief uh, background of Southern Mongolia. Southern Mongolia is widely known as Inner Mongolia in the West, uh, which is a direct translation of the Chinese word name Mongo, which is a highly uh, Sinocentric terminology that conveys the message that Chinese uh, message of the Chinese territorial claim over this part of Mongolia. In in a Mongolian language, we uh, call ourselves as Uru Mongol, which is a simple geographical terminology, uh, meaning uh, it's a southern southern part of Mongolia or southern Mongolia. Unlike the deliberate Chinese translation, it has no meaning of inner whatsoever. Uh, therefore, we always prefer uh, to use Southern Mongolia over Inner Mongolia. So from a territorial, territorial perspective, Southern Mongolia has a vast territory of nearly 2 million square kilometer, uh, covering the, the so-called Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region, and Mongolian inhabited areas and neighboring Chinese provinces and the historical Mongolian territory elsewhere within the borders of uh, the People's uh, Republic of China. From, um, from the uh, demographic 
uh, perspective, the Mongolian population of southern Mongolia is about 6 million, which is twice as large as the, uh, that, that of the independent country of Mongolia, we, we usually call northern Mongolia. Uh, Southern Mongolia was officially occupied by China in 1949 and became the, the first so-called nationality minority autonomous region of China. Since then, Southern Mongolia has been um, the testing <coughs> ground of China's all forms of ethnic policies, including genocide, ethnic cleansing, political purge, economic exploitation, cultural assimilation, and environmental destruction. As early as in uh, the 1950s, uh, the Chinese government uh, started its ethnic cleansing under the various uh, pretexts. For example, during the so-called anti-national rightist movement in the 1950s, tens of <clears throat> thousands of Mongolian intellectuals were accused of being national rightists and are uh, arrested, imprisoned, and tortured. <coughs> Excuse me. From the uh, late 1960s through the early 1970s, uh, the Chinese government carried out a massive genocide campaign in Southern Mongolia. Uh, at least 100,000 Southern Mongolians were killed and a half million persecuted. At that time, the total uh, Mongolian population of Southern Mongolia was about 1.5 million. That means one out of three Mongolians were persecuted uh, during this uh, massive genocide campaign. In the 1980s, the Chinese government has escalated its cultural assimilation and population transfer in Southern Mongolia. Millions of Chinese peasants poured into Southern Mongolia and uh, pushed the indigenous Mongolians out of their own uh, ancestral land. Starting early 2000, the Chinese government has implemented a series of uh, new policies under which the Mongolian traditional nomadic way of life was blamed for the environmental degradation, which in fact was caused by the um, uh, large-scale Chinese farming and agricultural practice. Under the pretext of recovering grassland ecosystem, these policies, in, uh, including uh, ecological migration and uh, total ban over livestock grazing, uh, was implemented uh, to forcefully displace the ethnic, uh, the entire um, Mongolian herder po population from their ancestral lands to predominantly Chinese populated. Uh, urban and uh, agricultural areas. So the grazing, um, the livestock on the grassland is considered a crime in Southern Mongolia. And the herders who graze their livestock on their own land have been subjected to um, fine, confiscation of livestock, arrest, detention, and even imprisonment. Uh, according to the Chinese central government website, um, a state council website, by the end of 2015, China would resettle all remaining 1.2 million nomads within its borders. This not only includes the Mongolian uh, nomads, but also like Tibetan and I think uh, Kazakh nomads as well. So this means China has officially put to an end to the millennium old uh, nomadic civilization seven years ago within its territories within its borders. As the final move toward the eradication of Mongolian uh, national identity, what the, uh, the government of China is implementing in uh, Southern Mongolia today is a wholesale cultural genocide aiming at the complete eradication of Mongolian language. This new round of cultural genocide started last September uh, with the so-called the second generation bilingual education policy. In uh, early June uh, last year, officials from the Chinese Ministry of uh, Education visit visited Southern Mongolia and verbally communicated the central government's decision to the local uh, educational bureaus and school authorities. Uh, the total secrecy of the plan and the uh, surreptitious way 
it was uh, carried out. It's just that uh, it's just that the covert and genocidal nature of the campaign. Even until today, there has been no single official document from the Chinese central government on this the so-called the major national strategic deploy, uh, deployment. Uh, in response to this uh, final destruction to the Mongolian culture, uh, identity, and language, the entire Mongolian, Southern Mongolian population has stood up last year. Uh, starting the late August last year, a uh, region wide civil uh, disobedience resistance movement broke out across Southern Mongolia. From kindergartners to uh, well known uh, kindergartners to well known intellectuals, from middle school schoolers to college students, from ordinary herders to rural villagers, uh, from musicians and art, uh, artists to taxi drivers, from government officials to party members, even some police of, uh, officers of Mongolian ethnicity, um, people from all walks of life of Southern Mongolia have stood up to this new round of cultural genocide. Despite the uh, police intimidation and official uh, propaganda, the Mongolian uh, parents organized themselves to launch a total school boycott. Estimated 300,000 students joined the school boycott. According to some uh, analysts, um, this protest was the, uh, the largest mass movement in mainland China um, since the 1989 uh, student movement. The level of coordination and uh, solidarity is unprecedented. Uh, not only the entire Southern Mongolian population uh, took part in the protest one way or another, but also the Mongolians around the world, including um, the independent country of Mongolia, Kalmyk, Buryat, Hazara uh, in Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan. Um, the, the people, you know, they are Mong you know, Mongolian, uh, they have uh, people in Mongolian origin. So, and uh, overseas Mongolian communities have uh, staged multiple protests in, in front of the Chinese embassies and um, uh, uh, consulate in, in their respective countries to show their solidarity to these other Mongolians on the ground. So the Chinese government, um, of course, uh, immediately uh, started cracking down uh, on the movement and arrested uh, around eight to 10,000 uh, Southern Mongolians. Thousands of them are still uh, detained, imprisoned, uh, and under house arrest without any uh, legal due process. So the following the harsh crackdown on the uh, resistance movement the, uh, the initially advertised bilingual education now is turned into a wholesale cultural genocide campaign. Uh, the scope of the campaign has far exceeded um, the, uh, the switching the, uh, be far beyond the switching the medium of instruction from Mongolian to Chinese in, in schools. Starting, for example, starting in January uh, this year, um, all the radio and uh, TV broadcasts have uh, been ordered to replace Mongolian cultural programs with the Chinese ones in order to promote the so-called strong sense of uh, Chinese nationality, common identity. Uh, so the learn Chinese and the become a civilized person is the propaganda that has been um, publicly uh, promoting the Chinese supremacy over M Mongolian language, culture, and identity. You can see these uh, ads and adver advertisement in TV screens and uh, billboards everywhere in South Mongolia. In uh, other efforts to speed up the, <clears throat> the linguistic assimilation from uh, the uh, general Mongolian population in South Mongolia, official TV and radio broadcasts have started teaching Chinese. Um, for for example, uh, there's a program called Follow Me to Learn Chinese. This is such a uh, new program broadcast uh, in the so-called Inner Mongolia TV station starting December, uh, last uh, December. As the cultural uh, the revolution style of propaganda campaign sweeps across other Mongolia, official uh, mouthpiece, uh, Chinese mouthpiece publicly advocate cultural assimilation. As publicly advocate, uh, advocating cultural assimilation 
and uh, for example let us improve the mutual assimilation of all ethnic groups to firmly establish the chinese nationality common identity is, is some uh, another slogan um, that you can you can see from tv and uh, you know you can uh, uh, see in the on the street so political advertisement highlighting the uh, importance of the national unity uh, national unity means national unity of the chinese nationality not talking about you know the uh, the so called ethnic minorities are no longer called no longer called nationality they call it ethnic group so in um, china and then they even publicly uh, saying that uh, in the so called the second generation ethnic policy said uh, the 55 uh, the so called uh, ethnic minorities should not um, assert their uh, individual ethnic identity. They are all Chinese people, Chinese or Zhonghua uh, nationality. So uh, the originally called nationality minority or nationality term in uh, nationality in English has disappeared from Chinese vocabulary now. And then it's all uh, turned into like, you know, uh, every, everybody is turned into Chinese nationality. So Zhonghua nationality. <clears throat> in schools, uh, Mongolian students are subject to military-style training and propaganda activities. Uh, Mongolian college students are forced to wear Mao-style uh, uniforms and sing uh, communist red songs. Um, in a move to justify the total elimination of ethnic mi uh, minority languages from our educational system, the Chinese National Congress announced recently that education in minority language as local uh, legislation stability is unconstitutional. So again, education in minority language is unconstitutional. Uh, so that means uh, the uh, all uh, education must be um, uh, take place in uh, must uh, you know implemented in the Chinese language, which is called national. A common language now. Um, so uh, this is uh, published on the um, the People's Daily uh, website. Uh, this apparently overrides the Article Four of the Chinese Constitution that stated all ethnicities, ethnicities have the freedom and rights to use the use and develop their own uh, spoken and written language uh, to preserve or reform their own. Uh, folk ways and customs. So local authorities in the, uh, the, uh, the so-called Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region acted promptly to implement this uh, directive. Uh, subjects to <coughs> Mongolian culture and history taught in Mongolian local schools are considered uh, under-emphasizing the Chinese nationality common identity and deliberately over-emphasizing uh, over individual ethnic groups, ethnic identity and uh, ethnic sentiment and removed from the uh, subject, uh, uh, the, these uh, subjects are removed from the uh, curriculum across the region. So the latest information we received suggests that the so-called uh, nationally compiled textbook reform is pushed far beyond Mongolian elementary school and middle schools. All Mongolian kindergartens are also ordered to teach in Chinese. Uh, learning Mongolian is strictly banned. Talking about Mongolian culture is not allowed. And uh, it has to be, now the Mongolian culture has to be called Chinese grassland culture instead. So uh, in order to completely block all possible means of uh, learning a Mongolian, on January 9th this year, uh, the uh, Autonomous Region Department of Education uh, issued a document to ban any school, any teacher, any parents from having any extracurricular activities to teach Mongolian or learn Mongolian. Um, extracurricular activities must be devoted to inculcating the Chinese uh, nationality common identity. So flagrant uh, 
cultural annihilation is the most visible in a series of art and cultural performance put together by the Chinese authorities uh, during the, the Mongolian Chagansar or uh, Lunar um, Traditional uh, New Year, uh, Lunar New Year of the Mongolian. Um, so Peking operas have uh, replaced the Mongolian traditional performance in TV programs across the region. Uh, in some programs like Mongolian traditional dances are converted to hybrid ones that exhibit full features of um, Chinese operas like uh, Mongolian traditional uh, music instrument horse uh, head fiddle uh, is uh, played in concert with the sona, uh, which is a, a, a you know a traditional Chinese uh, instrument, and the Mongolian <coughs> most sacred sites like uh, places like Obo, uh, which is a very sacred uh, place in across southern Mongolia, are also uh, not spread from Chinese cultural invasion, like Chinese traditional younger performance in red and pink clothes flooded these uh, secret sites, mocking the Mongolian uh, traditional Abar ritual ceremony. So uh, on the official, official front, the Chinese uh, central government uh, sent a number of uh, high-ranking officials to the uh, regional uh, capital Hohat to investigate why the authorities of the autonomous region failed to prevent the large-scale protest from happening in last September. Uh, so as a result, um, uh, Mongolian officials and Mongolian uh, educational workers were to be blamed uh, of the, um, the reluctant in implementing the educational policy and harboring narrow national sentiment. So um, as a result, the re region-wide um, intensive training campaign has kicked off. Uh, according to Inner Mongolia uh, News official website, the first session of the regional educational system special training for firmly inculcating the Chinese nationality common identity started on December 8th, 2022, uh, 20, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, although, the, um, although the exact details of the training uh, and the total number of the trainees remain unknown, the um, local media uh, reported that the uh, Synchronized training sessions are held in all schools, colleges, and universities uh, throughout the autonomous region. The, the latest news report from Chinese official media revealed that, that the training of the inculcating the Chinese nationality common identity have already started in rural Mongolian communities at village level across the region. So uh, a 47 page internal document entitled the propaganda pamphlet, pamphlet for inculcating the Chinese nationality common identity to push for the use of nationally uh, compiled textbook and national common language education was issued by the autonomous region department of education in January 2021 for the for this purpose the full um, uh, you know this, this pamphlet is uh, full of Xi Jinping's quote um it, it's considered the, <clears throat> this this one was considered the bible of this new cultural genocide campaign um almost like equivalent to mao's red book to the cultural revolution the, the, the pamphlet um states uh, uh that um uh there includes a xi jinping speech uh, during uh, his visit to xinjiang in 2014 saying that the Chinese nationality cannot separate from national minorities. National minorities cannot separate from Chinese nationality. So, um, so uh, it's it's uh, uh, noteworthy that that the training pamphlet frequently quotes from Xi Jinping's remarks made in Xinjiang, where the millions of Uyghurs have been uh, thrown into concentration camps for the so-called training. Uh, the pamphlet also uh, warned the Mongol, southern Mongolians that the uh, the wrong path of uh, narrow uh, nationalism can easily lead to the return of 
separatist tendency. So it's clear this is, uh, you know, uh, this moment is to, to uh, try to wipe out the uh, the Mongolian uh, sense of uh, national freedom or uh, aspiration for national freedom. So this is what's happening in Southern Mongolia today, which is a wholesale cultural uh, genocide aiming to wipe out the Mongolian culture and um, identity once and then for all to create a homogeneous Chinese society where uh, there's no worry of uh, national uh, problems or uh, ethnic problems. So uh, that's what's happening in Southern Mongolia uh, today. I hope uh, we'll have uh, more discussion during the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you uh, Dr. Togochok, and uh, to, to just put the correct perspective on what discussions have taken so far. What you see is a common thread, very simple. Whether it's Tibet or Southern Mongolia or even East Pakistan, all this started in 1949, while the rest of the uh, nations around the world were too busy trying to get China amalgamated into the global order. So, you know, everyone was going out of their way to say, let's get China in, you know, he will be a responsible country and you know all this so he misused this opportunity in fact he used this opportunity of that goodwill even if it was temporary in nature to promote its own agenda that's very very clear no but all these countries are important to us you know india has also had historical relations with mongolia tibet and even xinjiang for that matter particularly when we had the old silk route that was uh, flourishing you know the silk route and of course the the maritime silk route that we are talking about and the Silk Route economic belt that we are talking about is all just nothing but old wine in new bottle. You know, it's not that the Silk Route did not exist centuries ago. It is only through the Silk Road that we established contact. The Buddhism, you know, went across continents from one side to the other. So, you know, no, uh, let, let's get some more uh, perspectives as far as uh, Tibet and uh, East Pakistan are concerned before I hand over to Mr. Lekshay. Uh, one thing is which is very clear as far as Tibet is concerned is that I think uh, as I uh, indicated in the opening remarks, uh, you know, we perhaps erred very badly in uh, understanding the situation at that time. You know, it was Tibet our neighbor and, you know, it's China which has become our neighbor by uh, this forced occupation. Just a few months ago, we had uh, Dr. Dexter, uh, you know, who had a detailed discussion with us and he's uh, carried out more than 10 years of research uh, to tell us that Tibet was never under the occupation of Chinese. You know, these are some historical facts. You know, of course, there has been some change of hands here and there, but the point is that Tibet was never uh, a vassal state of China as such till 1949 when the world closed its eyes and allowed China to walk over. So if only the world had woken up to these grim realities, whether it is in East Turkestan or in Tibet or in Southern Mongolia, we would not have had this situation today. It's perhaps becoming, as some of the people have already written down in the chat box, it is becoming a little more complicated and uh, even challenging uh, to now reverse the situation. You know, it's not like the Soviet Union. You know, many people try to compare this with the Soviet Union and say, no, it's less like the Soviet Union. Perhaps China will break up one day. But I know this this is something that that works both ways. You know, Soviet Union had a very different way of uh, uh, you know dealing with its uh, republics, uh, the so-called the Union Republic, Soviet Socialist Republics. And whereas over here, you know, it is a Hunization of the entire colony, which is what has come out very clearly in all the three presentations so far. Even in Tibet, you know, Colonel Harriaran has already had a question and I'm sure it will be responded to. They are trying to now even in, involve them in their uh, army, PLA. So they're raising Tibetan units who are well versed with the harsh climates and higher uh, terrain operations. This is something serious. So, you know, and uh, the another point as far as uh, Dr. Sali is concerned is that, uh, you know, I raised this question last time when he addressed us, which is that the silence of the OIC and the Muslim countries. This is what, you know, if we cannot get the Muslim countries on our side, uh, Dr. Sali, I think we already lost the case. We saw what, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, our uh, neighbor, uh, Pakistan had to say uh, when he was questioned by uh, the reporters on this and to say that hey, whatever China is doing in respect of Uyghurs is right. And you know, the same is the case with Saudi Arabia, with Iran, with Iraq, whoever you take, even Afghanistan for that matter. 
even the taliban is supposed to have said that we will not allow any east pakistan movement to take place from us so this is uh, basically the money that is making them sing so under this question i know that it's extremely challenging for uh, salih udair uh, to get the world on its side there have been some questions here also on the legal dimensions of this we all only need to be reminded of the fact that in 2016 when philippines won the case in the international court of justice and you know the pca the permanent court of arbitration uh, issued those strictures against china has china complied or does it have any intention even to comply with this so even if you do establish the the legality or otherwise of the forced occupation of uh, these three neighbors uh, you know that's taiwan uh, tibet, tibet and sorry not taiwan tibet uh, southern mongolia and uh, east turkestan uh, will china accept any kind of a verdict even if it's issued one is of course it has the veto i think another point which has brought out in the chat box now what what i see is that unless there is unanimity in in the global uh, uh, opinion uh, making uh, circles and they are able to act together you know uh, the challenges will only increase and that's the harsh reality today and we need to be able to acknowledge this harsh reality that china is taking every measure because people the nations including the those voices for democracy are keeping quiet you know now as was rightly brought out by uh, <coughs> uh, dr sali uh, it is not just an issue of human rights it is it is a issue of illegal occupation the moment you say that it is human right violation within its borders you are you are already accepting that it's part of china this is not the case even in the case of tibet it is not so so you know i think these are some uh, a very serious questions that we need to address and i also separately asked whether there is some kind of a coordinated movement by uh, the affected nations you know who are here whether it's turkestan or tibet or southern mongolia have they pulled together for efforts internationally to raise a voice and are they working separately particularly dr sali is he working with the muslim countries to you know bring them to say that you know money is not everything you know the slowly their whole identity of the muslims the uyghur muslims in uh jinjiang is uh, something that that has been threatened the very existence of uh, the, this identity uh, has been already eroded uh, i hope it's not too late but all the indications which are there you know including you know of course i did mention that all of us read through the ap news report and you know uh, you know how they can distort anything which is there this is the case of distortion serious distortions which are there application of law as convenient use of science and technology use of artificial intelligence there are these reports which are available in the open sources to tell you that the ai is being used you know to interrogate uh, eagers uh, in, in detention camps just by his body language when he is being interviewed itself is likely to give him an indication as to he is he uh, a potential terrorist now who is a potential terrorist is is a definition that they would have laid down for the ai the artificial intelligence algorithms to establish so it's their definition of who the terrorist is and who a muslim is so these are some very serious issues that we need to address i thought i'll just flag some of these issues before again requesting uh, uh, you know lakshay to come in briefly to tell us what are the options available in fact i would uh, uh, also request the other two uh, speakers distinguished speakers uh, to tell us what do they think uh, is the future and how do you expect to work together to change the narrative of the chinese now with that uh, may i now again request uh, uh, mr lakshay uh, to come in and tell us more specifically on what can be done not necessarily just by india but by other uh, countries who believe in uh, you know uh, the liberal democracy and uh, secularism and uh, those issues as uh, mr sali and tobisho has mentioned about uh, what kind of a sensationalization design which the chinese communist party has been putting on with the minorities or the different nationalities which were being occupied by the communist china so uh, as uh, they have mentioned the cultural assimilation right economic marginalizations and also ecological destructions were very much there not just in tibet but in all the oppressed right uh, areas or countries which china has occupied so somehow i will i'll just briefly uh, uh, just look at how some of the chinese think about tibet 
right, the, the current threat. One of the professor who's in, the Chinese professor who lives in America says that, uh, I will, I'll just quote him, there are more Chinese than Tibetan in Tibet. There are more windows, there are more uh, Chinese than the Tibetan. There are more surveillance cameras than the windows. There are more uh, policemen than the monks. Right. That's how the surveillance is all about. But that's all the whole mechanism of right controlling Tibet is all about. What do you need in the in the monasteries where people go there for the devotions? Why do you need surveillance cameras? Right. So therefore, in Lhasa itself, there are people saying that there are more surveillance cameras than the than the windows. Right. So therefore, uh, it is a design. Is a is a intended design by the Chinese Communist Party uh, with the fear that they will lose Tibet from the grave. Somehow, in a, some of the secret uh, meeting which they have held, but they said that the population transfer is the solution to solve the Tibet problem. But if you send as many Chinese into Tibet, because as we all know, that Tibet has only around 6 million Tibetans, and the land mass is huge, right? So China, right from 1950s, they try to design in utilizing the Tibetan land mass by, by putting, right, so much of Chinese people inside Tibet, right from 1950s, right? So therefore, now they were quite clever in uh, telling the world that if you look at Tibet, as I said before, tourism has become a number one. Right, number one development project in such Tibet. Earlier, tourism and mining was supposed to be the pillar of the development. Now, tourism is supposed to be the number one pillar. So every now and then, China says proudly that more than like this year, they said 35 million people visited Tibet. Right. So if you look at Tibet, some sometimes we get confused by Chinese narration of Tibet. Right. So therefore, we need to understand that when they said they have 35 million Chinese tourists in Tibet. They, they only means Tibet autonomous region. So let me be very clear. Tibet is not just Tibet autonomous region. Tibet composed of all the three traditional provinces of Tibet. That is Amdo and Kham, which is being integrated into Qinghai, Sichuan, Yunnan, and Kansu. So therefore, you need to understand, right, how China tried to push their own population, their Han population into, into Tibet. Somehow, if you look at Xi Jinping's right, report, the recent report, his visit, he talks loud about the ethnic unity inside Tibet. Right. So that shows that uh, they tried to drive away the Tibetan right, uh, legitimacy of Tibetan on Tibet. Not just, they don't mention Tibet. He just called the ethnic unit, unity inside Tibet, which developed Tibet. So somehow they tried to distinct, right, distinct away the Tibet from the Tibetan. So that is very important as such in their own design of occupying Tibet. And it is very, right, uh, I would say that it's very clear that there is still a fear in the mind of the Chinese leader that they couldn't control Tibet, even though it's, they put hardline as Mr. Sali uh, mentioned about the stackyard policy. Tibet also went through stackyard policy, right? We went through all the mechanisms which China tried to push hard in controlling Tibet as being part of China, but somehow they couldn't do it well. But as I said earlier, the only issue with us right now, the only threat with us is the Sinicization of Tibet. If we lost the Tibetan culture, if we lost the Tibetan identity, right, so what is it all about? So therefore, as Commander Watson talks about, what is the way out? So way out is, as we all know, that China is going, right, is the number one, number two power in the world. They are still struggling. 
in their relation with other countries. But still, but if you look at the economy, if you look at the military, if you look at all the other things, you know, developments, China, right, it has its own place in the world. But somehow Tibet, right, so far, right, even though whatever they try to project Tibet in a beautiful manner, but it remained as the throne, right? It remained as an irritant, right? Even though they tried to develop Tibet in a way to fulfill their own aspirations, not to help the Tibetan. There were lots of projects going on in Tibet, infrastructure developments, right? Township plannings, right? Changing from village to town, town to city levels, right? There are so many things designed, but some of the uh, tourists who visit Lhasa told us that there were so many concrete buildings right coming up in Lhasa. Are they for the Tibetan? I don't think so. Right. Then who are these all for? They are meant for the Ch Chinese immigrants who come for the economic opportunities who are being pushed by, who are being given uh, uh, assistance by the government, right, to go to Tibet, to live over there, to sustain their life, to build up their own. But somehow, I, I believe that, right, if they try to continue doing that and try to synthesize Tibet by different means, then it's difficult to understand where it should be, right, in the future. So therefore, His Holiness has paved a way for a, a mutually beneficial solution, right? That's a middle way policy through dialogue, right? If we can talk to the Chinese for their own benefits and for the Tibetan benefits, for the long-term future, it will serve both the purpose. Therefore, uh, if you look at, see, if you look at right now in, in Tibet, there was, uh, as, as far as Human Rights Watch reports in 2016, the surveillance measure which they have been putting, they said that 25% of the cost of the regional government revenue goes to the surveillance. Right. That means that more than around 21,000 Chinese communist cadres from urbans and towns were being disseminated into 5,000 Tibetan villages for surveillance, right? And it is not just for the surveillance. If you look at how the Tibetan Buddhist traditions are being controlled, as per the state uh, administrations on religious affairs, right? Now there are mechanisms which were be built to, to monitor, right? Monitor the, uh, the curriculums of the religious schools, monitor who should be recruited, in the, in the monasteries, right? And they, even recently also, the party cutters from Tibet were being given the instructions that they cannot go for uh, religious teachings. They cannot uh, use the religious items in their home, right? So they, they were giving strict instructions even for the party officials of Tibetan origins, right? Not to follow the Tibetan traditions. So that's the kind of a threat which we are work, uh, which we, we think is a kind of disturbing, right? And uh, another thing which they've been working on is the inter-ethnic marriages which they've been promoting. And the state has been working as an agent, as an actor, a player to enroll, to lure the Tibetan to marry the Han Chinese, the other Chinese, right? So the numbers are growing, picking up, right? And it's being, uh, they're being uh, given uh, provisions, right? So therefore, I think it's another design where the assimilation of Tibetan culture is very much, right, uh, working in place, right? And uh, we can also look at uh, how Chen Zhang Go in 1914 says, right? When you look at intermarriages, he said that the blood is thicker than the water. If you got intermarriage, if it's a success if it's a success right then the blood matters more than the water so it's a kind of a design which they try to right indulge inside right where uh they could uh they could say that in the future what is all tibet about 
Right. So therefore, it is really uh, important for us to understand the threat which we are living inside. Even for the Tibetan Buddhist traditions also, right? They have this order number five, but right, where they recognize the Tibetan Buddhist uh, uh, leaders to be recognized by the Chinese government, right? No way in the history they have this kind of a thing, right? And then they have this database, they have all the privileges and all these things, they have been doing that. Somehow, right, if you look at Chinese design, right now, after this Tibet Work Forum, seven Tibet Work Forum, they said that the Tibetan Buddhism should be the Chinese characteristics. No way in the history, right, we can say that a Tibetan Buddhism is a Chinese characterized. If you look at all the canons, right, which were being translated, which were being preserved for more than a thousand years, all of them are being translated from Indian scripts, the Sanskrits and Pali, not from the Chinese. So how can they claim something which they don't earn it, which they don't have it? They don't have any legitimate right to say that the Tibetan Buddhism is the Chinese characteristics. Somehow they are uh, very much in, 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 in this moment, right? in this rejuvenation moment of Chinese dream, they call everything of Chinese characteristics, right? So we, we shouldn't, I think, uh, being fooled by the Chinese words of such thing. And then uh, I would say that the prototype of education, obviously in monasteries, is always being doing. The another threat which we are facing is a language. Even though there's a, there's a promotion of this bilingual thing, but it's a monolingual, right? China always strictly maintain the Mandarin as the language. Inside Tibet, I've been just heard, I just heard that earlier during the official ceremonies, the Tibetan words are being written on the banners along with the Chinese words. Now, these days, the Tibetan words are being gone, disappearing, right? And the streets names, the place names, everything has been changed into Chinese, right? As I said before, the Tibet, what world thinks about Tibet, right? When they project Tibet, it's only Tar, Tibet Autonomous Region. So the whole component of Tibet was going away. If we cannot challenge the Chinese on this truth, right? So therefore, uh, the language is also an issue. Now these days, the Tibetan, uh, the writers, scholars, intellectuals, artists, right, singers, but right. who talked about the preservation of Tibetan language, who talks about the human rights issues, but right. they were being put up in jail, they were being prosecuted, but right. there were a number of cases like this, right? And the websites which talk about the Tibetan language, when where there's a discussion, it's been closed, it's been monitored. There are huge surveillance going on in Tibet, right? Therefore, I will not take much time because there are lots of, lots of things going on in Tibet, and I hope that with the visit of President Xi Jinping, right, the, uh, there are new positive things. Uh, we all live in the hope, right? If there's no hope, the struggle will not go on. So therefore, I uh, live up with this last message that hopefully right, the China, Chinese leader will get the wisdom to understand the aspirations of not just Tibetan, but the East Turkestan, people of East Turkestan, people of Southern Mongolia, and even the Chinese people who are deprived of the human rights. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we are moving into the Q&A session. The first question is by Colonel Hariharan, sir. It is on Tibet, directed to Mr. Tenzin Lekshe. He has asked, it is reported Chinese are raising two regiments of Tibetan troops to man Indian border. Do you expect Tibetans would willingly join to take up arms for China? The whole existence of China, right, in Tibet for the last 70 years was not, but not peaceful. Right, the Tibetans, they don't believe in the Chinese leaders. They are forced to do that, right. They have been silent. 
so what they they try to do because right now as you all understand there is a border issue going on since Galwan last year right and now uh, the Tibetan SFF right the intelligence of S SFF in the border issue is also getting prominence in the Indian medias right so therefore the existence of SFF was there since 1960s now China understand that the, the regiment of Tibet or the Tibetan army is very much needed because for them, they are the people of plain. They are not the mountainous people, right? Tibetans are the mountainous peoples. We live in this Tibetan plateau for thousands of years, millennia, right? When they come from plain to the mountains, they have so many difficulties. So for their own benefit, for their own security, Right, they have to do it. But willingness, and I can say that. I can say that. Right. Because as I I forgot to mention, there is, as I said before, there is an economic marginalization inside Tibet. So out of need for the employment, the Tibetans, whatever they have employment opportunities, they go. So therefore, therefore the China as of now, right, they might have created the employment opportunity for the, the army regiment so people go there to live not to fight right and i don't think so because like as for the centuries as for centuries right we have this guru chela relationship with india and that will uh, it goes beyond right the prc's relation with tibet Right, PRC's relation with Tibet is just 70 years, but nothing more than that. But if you compare with India, our relationship with India is thousand years relationship. Right, so therefore, uh, it's just for the sake of employment, they might have done it, but not willingly, I don't think so. Thank you, sir. The next question is to Mr. Saleh. Uh, Ms. Numita, she has asked, on a podcast with Steve Bannon, you said that China has bought the silence of Muslim leaders with respect to the ongoing genocide against Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims by way of trade and investment. How do you think this can be countered within these Islamic countries and others? And to what extent do you think civil societies and Islamic republics can play a role in exerting pressure on their governments and standing up to China? So could you please unmute yourself? Well, this is a great question. Um, the problem here is, you know, China offers a lot of Muslim countries a lot of investment, no questions asked. Um, they just say, we want you to be silent on this issue. We don't care if you have any human rights violations. We won't, we don't care about your other issues inside your country. Um, as long as you are okay on this issue. So a lot of countries, and you know, they don't they don't have so many criteria. They give them, you know, uh, very easy loans and so forth. Some things that Western nations have not been doing, um, and this is where they're able to, you know, buy the silence of you know Muslim countries. Um, and at the G7, I believe uh, more recently, the, this is something that. Uh, the U.S. is trying to do is they're trying to launch a new initiative to counter China's um, uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, by, you know, providing uh, investments um, to countries across the world. And I think this is the way that it needs to be done. Um, other countries, stronger, powerful countries need to invest in China, uh, invest in um, other countries, you know, like in the Middle East, in Africa um, and get them to speak out on these issues because again it's all about economics Turkey for example is a Turkic country it's a Muslim country um, and it has you know both the religious and the ethnic ties to us yet it is completely silent uh, not only is it silent in many ways it is complicit it's deporting our people to, uh, you know, back to East Turkestan. It's, you know, 
trying to uh, stop us from even engaging any peaceful demonstrations. Um, they know our issue better than the rest of the world, yet they are silent. Why? Because China is giving them a lot of money and the West, you know, their relationship with the West is not that great. And so th this is one of the, the major problems here. Uh, as far as civil society, I mean, civil society in Muslim countries, reaching out to them and trying to get them to speak out is very difficult as well. Um, we, for example, we have 50,000 uh, Uyghurs or East Turkestanis uh, who live in Saudi Arabia, uh, who had fled, you know, in the 1930s and 40s, and they became um, in many ways assimilated. Uh, many of them are, you know, wealthy, you know, living a good life, are able to contribute, you know, to, to our cause if they, if they wanted to. Yet they fear the Saudi government and because of that they're not able to even comment, uh, yet alone support our, our cause. Um, that's another problem. Uh, it, most Muslim countries are unfortunately a bit author author authoritarian. Um, whether that's Pakistan, whether that's, you know, Saudi Arabia, whether that's Iran, uh, you know, Turkey, um, unfortunately, you know, even Egypt, for example, uh, they all have their own problems and the governments there are not very keen of human rights or anything of that so forth. Um, and so if they were to speak out, they would end up endangering themselves. Um, so it revolves around speaking out to reach, reaching out to civil society in countries like you know Bangladesh, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, where we have seen some some success there, um, uh, and in the Western world. But in other Muslim countries, Muslim countries that you know actually would be able to do something, uh, they they are they are too close to China at the moment. And unless the free world can, you know, convince them to align with them and not with China, I don't see them supporting uh, or speaking out, supporting us or speaking out anytime soon. And that's the reality. Thank you very much. The next question is also on East Turkestan by my director of Komodur Aras Vasan. He has asked, how does the unfolding situation in Afghanistan influence the movement for East Turkestan? So as far as Afghanistan, we are just monitoring the situation. I mean, we, there were some Uyghurs that had fled there in the 90s, um, you know, following uh, the Soviet-Afghan war, many Uyghurs were inspired um, by what happened, you know, the, the Afghans defeating the Soviets and this led to the Barn Uprising in 1990. Um, and then with the fall of the Soviet Union, you had some uh, militancy uh, in East Turkestan um, for, for a while. Um, it was initially a national movement, then Chinese intelligence, they, uh, they were able to uh, infiltrate and separate it and you know, portray it creating uh, one as an Islamist movement in an effort to portray Uyghurs uh, and other East Turkestanis as terrorists. Um, and it's still trying to do the same thing. Uh, however, there's, as far as the Taliban, you know, they, they've already made their, their, their statement very clear. Uh, you know, they are going to support, you know, China. They're not going to, they, they made, they gave the same answer as your neighbors, uh, Pakistan, you know, we, we care about Muslims, but, you know, we're not going to interfere in China's in so-called internal affairs. Um, and in this case, they're like, oh, we, we want Chinese investment. China is our friend. And even Global Times, Chinese state media, they are telling their own people, the Chinese people, you know, uh, don't view the Taliban as bad. They don't really support the East Turkestan movement. Sure, there are some, some there, uh, East Turkestanis in Afghanistan but they don't support them. Um, and that's the, the thing, they, the Taliban has never supported, uh, you know, the East Turkestan movement, and no Muslim organization really has, you know, they just use us as cannon fodder 
to you know achieve their whatever geopolitical agenda that they have thank you sir the next question is both for uh, mr tenzin and to mr hodeya commodore basin sir has asked what coordination efforts are taking place between tibet east pakistan and southern mongolia as the issues are similar more so often from the point of view of international law about illegal occupations may i request uh, mr tenzin to intervene here first and followed by mr hodeya uh, thank you thank you so much uh, uh, the- over the over the years right uh, there were solidarities there were alliances uh between the tibetan southern mongolian and even the uh, east turkestan right uh, so the solidarity movement was already there the alliances is already there so the matter is how effective we should be aligned together to 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 challenge the chinese policy the the hardline policy towards these colonized countries right so therefore uh, is uh, we look forward to have more alliance to work together right to uh, to tell the world that what is happening inside china in these areas is not what china propagates right and china they always try to propagate good things but unfortunately the truth has to prevail they cannot simply just lie all the time but shying away but if you look at xi jinping's visit if you look at all the uh, the uh, the documentaries which they try to project on tibet it looks beautiful right even now the indian newspaper even even the indians now they try to propagate the chinese line right uh, so therefore uh, uh, we cannot be fooled by the chinese design but whether we should work actively to to tell the world that whatever china did to us was wrong and inhuman and illogical and illegal right so we move forward to have more alliance and the solidarity with all the uh, not just with east turkestan not just with southern mongolia but even with the chinese dissidents right but so therefore uh, they are uh they are working uh, we work forward thank you mr patel your uh, response please uh like mr tenzin i mean uh, we uh, i mean he pretty much summed up everything that i was going to say um we do look forward to you know establishing closer uh you know uh, alliance and ties and work cooperation with the uh Tibetan government in exile and the Tibetan community as a whole um because especially on our issues um we have a fair, fairly decent diaspora sized diaspora across the world uh Tibetans and the East Turkestani community uh both of our issues are one of the biggest headaches for uh for China and then vis-a-vis India I mean both of East Turkestan and uh Tibet share uh you know uh, a border with um each, not only each other but also with india so in this area there's i think many avenues um in which we can cooperate um the tibetans they have more experience uh than us and so we would like them to share their experiences that they have gotten over the years because our government in exile um due to you know various political reasons uh was set up very very late um because we were not able to find a host nation to host a government in exile until 2004 when the US was uh willing um prior attempts had been made in the 1960s in um in uh the Soviet Union in in Turkey uh in the in Saudi Arabia um and it all failed um and so essentially um the US in the, after 2004 and 2004 the US was uh actually willing to host us here so we are grateful for that um but we definitely um need to learn from the experience um of the uh, Tibetans uh they seem to be much more uh organized than us 
Um, and so we'd like to uh, communicate with them and, and develop, uh, you know, uh, to improve ourselves um, and then to develop further uh, coordination with them. Thank you, sir. The last question is to Mr. Tenzin by Commodore Basin, sir. Uh, Bala, can I add one more thing? Yes, please. Uh, for this Solidarity Alliance, what we look is that uh, since our leadership is His Holiness and His benevolent leadership has taught us to move towards the non-violent means of what attending the, the solution of Sino-Tibetan conflict. So for us, for the Tibetan non, for the Tibetan cause, right, the uncompromising position is non-violence. But right? we go with the non-violence in our cause, and we had a belief, we believe that till the end, the truth will prevail, right? But we will not compromise on non-violence. So as long as all our alliance, Right. All our solidarity movements, if they aligned on these shared values of nonviolent approach, will definitely be more looking towards more collaborations, right, and more uh, activities. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. The last question is by, in the best interest of time, I request the distinguished speakers to keep their uh, comments brief. The last question is by Kamodo Basan, sir. He has asked, how do you see the issue of the Panchen Lama unfolding in Tibet politics and religious discourse? So this one is a uh, very interesting question and, and a very important question also. So who is Panchen Lama? Now the question is, China has appointed their own Panchen Lama, right? Which they don't have any kind of legitimate right to go with, but they appointed. And they appointed in a way that right, when His Holiness appointed a six years old child as the reincarnation of the Benjamin Lama, a week later, he was disappeared, the child was disappeared, his parents were disappeared, his tutor was disappeared, right? Everybody around him disappeared. That was in 1996. Till now, the child which was being recognized by His Holiness as the reincarnation of Panjin Lama, even the UN cannot find that person, even now. But China, they have appointed their own Panjin Lama. But how much of how much of authority he has on the Tibetan Buddhism is a big question mark. There were issues that he lives in China most of the time, right? And he rarely goes to Tibet, right? With the order from the Chinese government, right? As for the need of the China, so therefore, right? If you just recently, I was being told that he visited some places in Amdo, in the northeastern side of Tibet. In many of the social media sites, they show that he visited Tibet, right, on this northeastern side of Tibet, but they don't show his face. They showed the photo of the previous Benjamin Lama. So this shows, this shows this kind of uh, authenticity of, right, the Benjamin Lama, which was been appointed, right. The people were being also very smart, but not showing the His Holiness photo of uh, the Panjin Lama of the, uh, the kid who is being appointed by Panjin Lama. Otherwise, they will be put up in jail. But rather, it was not illegal for them to show the previous Panjin Lama. So even in Tibet, right, this discourse, how the China tried to project the religious discourse religious practice, religious tradition into the politics for their own selfish politics. So therefore, uh, for as of now, right, 
we don't consider right the Chinese appointed pension lama as the pension lama. Right, the real pension lama is still missing. Right, therefore, this discourse, whatever they are doing, whatever they try to propagate, they try to propagate for their own benefits, for their own political agenda. Right. So therefore, we are also worried about how China try to manipulate or try to indulge in the Tibetan tradition by using the Chinese characteristics. Right. So therefore, we are watchful of that. We know what, what they are doing. And it is not that it is new to Tibet. Right. The Tibetan Buddhism flourished for the last thousands of years. Right. And it will flourish in its own tradition. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much to both our distinguished panelists from Tibet, East Turkestan, and Southern Mongolia. I would like now hand over the floor to my director for his concluding remarks and vote of thanks. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Bala. Uh, thankfully, I already did my intervention uh, you know, after uh, Southern Mongolia because he was leaving, and all the points that I have raised are very relevant. I all I would like to say is that uh, you know there are so many issues which have uh, been flagged today, and uh, I think all the three affected uh, uh, I would like to call them nations or countries need to work together. You know, unfortunately, we have seen that uh, you know our own neighbor Tibet uh, has had serious issues uh, within and uh, even outside. It's only recently that uh, you know India seems to be reviewing its Tibet policy. Not that anything uh, is seen there out there. But but there are some uh, you know indications that there may be a change in the policy of India uh, towards uh, you know annexation of uh, Tibet by China. I know it's also important because of of the the work that's going on on uh, water and on hydro projects, hydroelectrical projects, huge dams which are being built. You know this is this is an indication of the possible water war in the future that that can unfold as far as Tibet is concerned. So, you know, uh, due to time constraints, though they have flagged a lot of issues and I've written it down. I don't think I'll be able to uh, cover all of them. Uh, and uh, so all that, that remains for me is to thank all the three speakers for that wonderful uh, presentation and also for flagging issues that are of relevance, not just to India, but to the global community. You know, the global community at large has to come together. You know, if, you know one, one point which strikes me most is the, the, the silence of the Islamic countries. If the Islamic countries themselves are so quiet, just because they are, you know, promised so much of investments and money, then you know, how do you expect others to react and respond? You now this this is becomes a serious question. You know, at, at the drop of a hat, if there is even a small stone that's thrown in Kashmir, the OIC condemns it. You know, here there are thousands, ten millions of people who are being, uh, <laughs> you know, indoctrinated. There is uh, there are reports of organ harvesting. There are satellite pictures which have come out about the. So how is that the Muslim countries are keeping quiet? You know, this is the question that I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, Hudayar is uh, coming to grips with. Uh, he needs to perhaps work at many levels through the government and at his level uh, to engage with the Muslim countries, because this is something that's serious. Unless you get the support of the Islamic countries, uh, I don't think we can move much forward as far as East Pakistan is concerned. As far as Tibet is concerned, uh, the ball is in India's court and also in, in, the, in the court of the other liberal democracies of the world you know, who have a great role to ensure that Tibet is not lost out in terms of religion, in terms of its position, in terms of its rich uh, cultural heritage that has come down. And as far as Southern Mongolia is concerned, you know, you know, people are not even aware, you know, that there's something called Inner Mongolia, which was called by China, which is actually the Southern Mongolia. And, you know, they were also annexed in 49. So, you know, in 49 has been a catastrophic year for these three. And, and, and a great year for China because they swallowed all these three uh, uh, neighbors and, you know, built their uh, kingdom. So again, uh, like I said, uh, I must thank uh, all the three panelists and particularly, uh, you know, our friend from uh, Tibet Policy Institute, who's recently taken over as a spokesperson, and also Dr. Sali Hudayar, uh, who uh, is making his second presence here. And has made some very important, I know, I know he's aware of the, of the challenges much more than any of us because he's there. And luckily, he has the support of the of of, of the liberal government in uh, USA, and uh, so hopefully uh, they will work. Um, this this is the opportune moment in in the assessment of the rest of the world and analysts. This is the opportune moment to strike because 
there is this sentiment against china you know but nobody seems to like china how many friends do they have no so just that that you know with the with the power of the money that they have they are able to hold the attention of the of the, of the governments around the world you know our own uh, neighbor as uh, even uh, hudair brought out imran khan says everything is fine you know they are doing the right thing in uh, xinjiang or east turkestan so if this is the kind of uh, trends and uh, uh, you know statements that are made by uh, uh, leaders around the world uh, china will be encouraged to uh, indulge in what it's be uh, known to do genocide fratricide occupation of territory hanization increased surveillance and all that so this is where we are i know I, I, the picture looks gloom at this moment but you know it's it's for us to work together to see that it's not gloomy and there is some optimism because of the opportunity presented by china today because of its wolf warrior diplomacy and its aggressive behavior and and the kind of uh, uh, you know tensions that is brought about uh, in the entire global economy and health crisis thank you and and we look forward to having you having more of you here and and for bringing about this kind of an awareness on these important topics of great relevance not just to india but to the rest of the world thank you jai hind thank you very much jai hind thank you thank you thank you very much thank you kabir wasan thank you thank you thank you bala thank, thank you thank you thank you adair thank you sale yeah thanks for joining thank you bye bye thank you all